Alright ladies, so here is an example of what it's like to do notes by video. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you'll have your uh, notes from class, hopefully, that you can get in front of you. Um, and you'll just follow along in this video and fill in the blanks whenever you have them. Uh, and then also make note of anything that maybe confuses you and you might have questions about. And then we can address those sort of things the next time that we are uh, together in person at school. So we're going to try to actually finish off uh, the, the chapter 2 biochemistry notes with this video. Um, uh, but we do have several topics to consider. Uh, we need to look at water. We need to look at acid and base chemistry. We need to look at organic chemistry, which deals with your carbon compounds in the body. And then we're going to wrap things up with chemical reactions and enzymes. So if we start with water, uh, you know, water is incredibly important, right? It's, it's what some people would say is the most important chemical on the planet. Uh, and it's probably no coincidence that roughly two-thirds of the planet is covered in water and roughly two-thirds of your body is water. Uh, so it is highly critical. Uh, remember that it's, it's not one of the characteristics of living things necessarily, but uh, it is pretty much just as important as any of those things. Uh, now, water has a bunch of different chemical properties that are essential to living systems. And this could be something that's very internal or it could be something that's very external. So, for example, an external kind of consequence of water is that uh, it uh, floats when it freezes, right? Solid water, aka ice, is less dense than liquid water, which means ice forms at the top of a pond versus from the bottom up. Now, why is this a good thing? You may have never really thought about this before, but when you have a pond, right, and it's got um, some little fishies in it, right, I'm really bad at this, uh, you know, these guys, they don't like die off every winter. Uh, you just form a layer of ice at the top, which actually sort of insulates the fish below they make it through the winter if it's really cold, and then that ice melts back off when it's warm again and the fish are back and they're bigger and stronger than ever. If ice froze from the bottom up, you'd just see a bunch of dead fish laying on the surface of a frozen pond, <laughs> and you would have no life in that pond come the next spring. So this is an extraordinarily important characteristic for marine life, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with the water inside of them. It's all about their external environment. Now, for humans, most of the characteristics of water that we care about have to do with the water inside of us. And the thing is, water has a lot of unique characteristics because water is a polar liquid. Now, what does this mean? So polarity is something I've found that sometimes confuses students and Certainly, if it is something that they heard about in 7th or 8th grade, they don't feel very confident about it usually when they come into high school. So, uh, to understand polarity, you have to understand the structure of water. So, a water molecule, as seen in this picture over here, is a single oxygen atom combined with two hydrogen atoms. And we always say that a water molecule is bent. Um, that has to do with a little bit deeper chemistry than we're worried about. But the hydrogens tend to kind of sit on one side of uh, the molecule or one side of that oxygen atom. Now, when we look at oxygen, it has eight protons in its nucleus, so eight positive charges. And hydrogen just has one proton in its nucleus, so one positive charge. Now then, as we mentioned last week, the uh, uh, electrons in a water molecule are actually being shared between all of, and so they're here in blue, uh, all of these atoms. This is a covalently bonded molecule. So the electrons are shared, which means, you know, they orbit this hydrogen here, and then they orbit the oxygen for a little bit, and then they orbit this other hydrogen, and so on. Um, but here's where polarity comes in. The electrons are actually more drawn to this uh, 
do a dotted line here. Um, they're more drawn to this oxygen side of the molecule versus this hydrogen side of the molecule. And the reason those electrons are more drawn over here to this oxygen side is because oxygen has more positive charges. So there's all these positives and all these negative electrons that are swirling around this molecule are attracted to that positive. Now they're also attracted to these positives over here in the hydrogen, but not as much because there's just one or you could say two positives on this hydrogen side while there are eight positives on this oxygen side. The really silly analogy I've used in the past is if you came in in the morning and you could choose between two classrooms and in one classroom were eight incredibly attractive men and in the other classroom were just two incredibly attractive men, you probably go to the classroom where there's eight of them, right? And that is what these electrons are doing. Now, because of this uneven distribution of electrons, we get a sort of negative side here on the oxygen side and a sort of positive side here on the hydrogen side. And that is what polarity is. The molecule has two poles, a sort of positive side and a sort of negative side. Now notice that I'm saying sort of positive and sort of negative. It's not a full on charge like an ion would have like we saw last class, but it's just a, a, a sort of weak charge. So what we often do is we draw this little uh, delta plus and delta minus to represent that this is a polar molecule with a sort of positive on one side and a sort of negative on the other. Now, why does this whole polarity thing matter? Well, one of the main reasons is because a group of water molecules will be attracted to each other. So notice in this picture, the sort of positive hydrogen side of this one water molecule is attracted to the sort of negative oxygen side of this other molecule, and they form this little loose connection called a hydrogen bond. Now, a hydrogen bond will hold water molecules together. In other words, water as a liquid sticks together better than other liquids. So for instance, um, if you think about water droplets on a car or um, maybe on, on, a, on the table there at school, um, if we had a different liquid, like some kind of alcohol from a laboratory, rubbing alcohol, something like that, it doesn't really bead up. It doesn't really form droplets. And that's because that rubbing alcohol doesn't have this bonding between its, its molecules, so it doesn't stick together. It just kind of spreads out. Water wants to stick together, so the molecules uh, form up and they form little droplets or little beads, uh, and this makes water a unique liquid. Now something else that you see, because of these attractive forces between water molecules, are uh, these characteristics of cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is a general term which means attraction between molecules of the same type. So in this case we're talking about water being attracted to water. Uh, a lot of times I like to think it's like cohesion. If you're co-captains of a team you're on the same team, right? So cohesion or water molecules, the same type of water molecules, uh, attaching to each other. This is why, again, water forms tight droplets. This is why water has surface tension. Right? Anybody who's ever belly flopped really good in a pool is fully aware of surface tension. Um, you know, we are massive creatures, and I'm not calling you fat, I promise. It's just that, that humans were pretty large. And so it's not hard for us to say, you know, plunge our hand into a pool of water. But what you want to realize is that water really does have a pretty pretty good surface at the top of it. And again, like I said, if you've ever belly flopped in a pool, you felt that water smack you in the gut. You know, if you have a less massive creature like this creepy spider here, they can actually use that surface tension as a surface and they can walk on that water. 
Um, so we're not talking about Jesus, right? This isn't religion class. But some small insects and other organisms can actually uh, suspend themselves on the surface tension of water. We pass right through, but in some instances, you can feel it, right? You can smack the surface of water if you want to. Now, adhesion is another characteristic where molecules of different types are attracted to each other. So this is like water attracted to something else. Now, one of the main things that water adheres to is glass. All right, so if you ever have a thin tube or if you look at like a, a graduated cylinder in the lab, uh, water will, will draw up into that glass tube on its own. Um, uh, an example I can give you, if you've ever had your finger pricked before at the doctor's office, and then a lot of times what the nurse will use is a little tiny tube. and So, you, so prick your finger, you'll get this little bead of, of droplet of blood on your finger, and she'll touch that droplet with a little tube, and then you can just see the blood suck up into that tube. It's not that she's doing anything to vacuum that up into there, it's just that if you have a really thin tube, particularly one made of glass, the liquid just crawls up into the tube, basically, and that's because of adhesion. So cohesion, water sticks to itself. Adhesion, water sticks to other stuff. And again, this is all because of polarity and these um, sort of weak charges on the water molecules. All right, so now that we've covered water in general, we need to look at this concept of acid-base chemistry and pH, which I'm assuming you've heard of before, but I but um, we'll still kind of step our way through it. A water molecule, H2O, can break down into a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. H plus hydrogen ion, OH minus hydroxide ion. And so then when we look at a liquid, we have a measure called pH. And pH is a measure of the concentration of H pluses and OH minus ions in a system. And more specifically, it's looking at the concentration of H pluses. So pH basically tells us where on a scale do we fall in terms of the concentration of hydrogen ions in our liquid. Now the pH scale you may know already ranges from 0 to 14. Um, where zero, right, is really acidic, and 14 is really basic, and then we have everything in between. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that the pH scale is called a logarithmic scale. What that means is that an increase from, say, 6 to 7 is 10 times more H pluses. So it's not just one. So a change from 6 to 7 is actually like a really big change in terms of the pH of a system. Now, pH of 7 is neutral, right? And this is where you would find pure water. So remember, pure water turns into H plus plus OH minus. So an equal amount of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So pure water it has a neutral pH of 7. Anything lower than 7, 0 through 6 on this scale, is referred to as an acid, right? And this has more H pluses right, in the concentration. The more acidic you get, the lower the number, right? And then we can go the opposite direction as well. So everything from 8 and up, so 8 to 14, is considered basic, this would be more OH minus in our solution, and therefore less H plus. And again, the higher the number, the more basic you go. Um, sometimes uh, basic is also referred to as alkaline, if you've ever heard that before. I'm sure you've heard of alkaline batteries before, like AA, AAA batteries. Those are alkaline batteries, and um, but that term also can be used to refer to these bases on the pH scale. Now, what does that mean then when we look at like some kind of chemical like this uh, bleach here in this picture or this uh, 
lemon juice right here in this little silly cartoon. Well, an acid is any kind of compound that will give H pluses to a solution. So lemon juice and stomach acid, those are considered strong acids. Now, if we look at this from a chemical standpoint, right, stomach acid is called hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, is the chemical formula. Well, HCl can break down into H plus and Cl minus. So notice, if this breaks down, it puts H pluses into the solution. So it's an acid. Now, a base is a compound that will give hydroxide ions to a solution, or sometimes something uh, similar. Sometimes it's not always exactly hydroxides, but something similar to this. So strong bases include the bleach in this picture or ammonia. Um, same idea, like uh, really common bases, uh, sodium hydroxide, right, which has this formula. So this breaks down to Na plus and OH minus. So it would give hydroxide ions to the solution. Now the last little thing you need to know about acid-base chemistry is that there are things called buffers. Buffers are liquids or, or uh, chemicals that you can put into a system to keep it from becoming too acidic or basic. So a buffer might be a weak acid or a weak base, or actually sometimes it might be something that is neutral to help neutralize a system. So probably the best buffer in the world and the most natural buffer we have is water, right? It will always neutralize things. So water neutralizes. It will take you, uh, it will make a base less basic. It'll make an acid less acidic and take things closer to that neutral pH of seven. All right, moving on. Carbon compounds. Uh, I originally had these out of order in my slides at, at school. Hopefully I've matched them up to your notes now. Uh, so we mentioned last time that there are six elements that we really see a lot of in living organisms. But the most important structural element you have is carbon. A lot of times we are referred to as carbon-based life forms. Uh, if you hear like a science fiction movie or something, you know, or if we go to a distant planet and we look for life, we might be looking for carbon-based life. And, and that's because all life on Earth that we're aware of is made primarily from carbon. Now, carbon is unique in that it can form covalent bonds, so it can form big molecules, with up to four other elements. So you can get carbon surrounded by a bunch of other elements, and you can also get these chains of carbon, uh, or sometimes rings of carbon. So what we'll end up seeing is something that has like a bunch of carbon atoms, and then also um, uh, oxygen attached to it, and hydrogen attached to it. Uh, and again, these carbon atoms can form four different covalent bonds, so you can get all kinds of stuff going on here um, attached to it and form some really big biomolecules. Now, small carbon compounds are usually called monomers, mono meaning one, right? And then monomers go together to form bigger things called polymers, poly meaning many, right? So you might have a, a monomer made of carbon that uh, joins up with other monomers to form a big polymer, an even bigger molecule. And so there are four major carbon polymers in living things. We call them building blocks, or a lot of times we call them the major uh, biomolecules, or sometimes we might just call them carbon compounds. And these, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, because they're also an important part of our diet. Now the first of these building block carbon compounds are carbohydrates. Carbohydrate is actually what I drew on the last page there. They might be big chains like that, or they might actually be a ring of carbon uh, that looks something like this, with then other stuff attached to it as well. Uh, but carbohydrates are always just made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they are referred to in science as sugars. Now, 
don't let that mislead you. Carbohydrates don't have to be sugar like, uh, you know, white granulated sugar that you, you put into Kool-Aid or whatever. Um, carbohydrates can be grains like these breads and cereals. Carbohydrates are really high in fruits and vegetables. Um, they're, they're in, you know, pasta. But they're also in sweets as well because sugar is, is a carbohydrate. But the main function of carbs in your body is as a source of energy. So you eat carbs to get energy. You also store carbs in your body to use later as energy. Uh, and then sometimes carbohydrates can be structural as well. Uh, they're very structural in plants uh, where like the cell wall is completely made of carbohydrate. Now the second major carbon compound building block is protein. Protein is made up of smaller units called amino acids. So a lot of times what I would say is like the protein is like a house and the amino acids are like the bricks that you use to build the house. Now amino acids are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but then also some nitrogen. We also sometimes see some sulfur mixed in there too. Uh, these are uh, also a source of energy, a secondary source of energy, but mostly they're used for structure, building structures, right? Your, uh, your muscles are made of protein. Your skin is mostly protein. Your hair and nails are entirely protein. Uh, so, um, you know, most of the structural integrity of the body is based in proteins, but they also function in controlling chemical reactions when they serve as something called enzymes, and we'll get into that more here in a little bit. Uh, but protein, good sources of protein are um, egg white, right? The yolk is, is fatty, right? But the egg white is protein. Meat is protein. Uh, nuts, like peanuts, cashews, those are good sources of protein as well. Third thing is lipids, right, or fats. Uh, lipids, as pictured here, these are, uh, these are called adipose cells, which are little fat storage cells in your body. Uh, lipids are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is the way that your body stores energy. So these aren't the best source of energy. That's what carbohydrates are. But this is a way that your body stores energy long term uh, is in fat stores. Uh, these also make up cell coverings and serve as waterproofing mechanisms in your body. And so when we come back to cell structure, we'll talk a lot about membranes. And those uh, require lipids to be formed. And then the fourth and final one here is nucleic acid, which we'll also get into much more later this year. Uh, these are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and also phosphorus. And this is your DNA, right? So the nucleic acids are, are not dietary, right? This is not something we worry about eating, um, but they are involved in your genetic information. So you will use nucleic acids to build DNA. Okay, review time, right? Label each of the following as an acid or a base. So take a look at this for a second. Bleach, can you remember? Did we say that was an acid or a base? Did you say base? You are so incredibly smart. Okay, how about the stomach? Your stomach contents are really, really acidic. You're right, good job. And then lemon juice, yeah, you remember that fun picture we had. That's an acid as well. All right, it's the last portion of the notes here. I have to deal with chemical reactions. You may, if your previous teachers liked chemistry, have learned a lot about chemical reactions. You might not have. Uh, and we need to have just a very limited understanding and knowledge of reactions for our class. But you'll get into a lot more types of reactions uh, next year in chemistry. So a chemical reaction is some sort of process that basically changes one set of chemicals into another set of chemicals. And it does this by rearranging bonds. All right, so if we rearrange the bonds that we have in a couple of different molecules or, or uh, um, compounds, then we do a reaction. Now, the reaction, a reaction has an arrow in the middle, right? Uh, everything before the arrow 
is referred to as your reactants. These are the compounds that come into a chemical reaction. Everything after the arrow is referred to as the products of your reaction. Now this is actually an extraordinarily famous chemical reaction right here that you definitely are going to need to be able to recognize by later this year. Uh, does anyone know what it is? I circled it or I boxed it in green on purpose because this chemical reaction is photosynthesis. Yippee! And we'll learn about that later this year. So bonus points to you if you knew that. Now anytime you do a chemical reaction it involves energy. Right? Energy could be released whenever you break bonds in a compound. Energy might be absorbed uh, if you form a new bond in a compound. And, you know, sometimes a reaction that gives off energy, that can kind of happen on its own, right? That'll happen spontaneously in nature. But reactions that absorb energy require an energy source. They're a little tougher to get going. Um, and the reality is every reaction needs some kind of little bit of energy uh, to get it started. So the question is often, where does the energy come from? And right, so for instance, <clears throat> in photosynthesis on that last slide, where does the energy come from for photosynthesis? I bet you know this. All right, if you think about the things that plants need, one of the very first things that you always think of is the sun. Right? And so the sun provides the energy for that photosynthetic reaction to take place. And for any reaction to take place, you have to have some sort of energy source. So uh, this, uh, these pictures, uh, they're probably similar ones in your textbook now, but I, I scanned these out of an older version of your textbook. But these are great pictures. And, and what these are are energy diagrams. And they show you that no matter what kind of reaction you're doing, to go from reactants to products, you have to see an increase in energy. Right? And so down here on this one too, to go from reactants to products, we first have to see an increase in energy. So it doesn't matter if the uh, energy, or excuse me, the reaction absorbs energy right, meaning products have higher energy than reactants, or if the energy, re or the reaction releases energy, meaning that the reactant energy is higher than the products. Notice that in both cases, you have a hill. Right? And that hill that you have to climb to get the reaction started is called your activation energy. So in this top case, you got a pretty big activation energy. In this bottom case, you got a little bit lower activation energy. But in both cases, you got to climb this hill, right? And this can be a major obstacle. Some reactions happen easier than others, and, and some of them are really hard to get going because they got a big hill to climb in terms of their energy. Now, the reality is that the majority of chemical reactions in a living system, like your body, are way too slow. To keep you alive. So if we were to allow the chemical reactions in your body to take place just at their own pace, you wouldn't survive. They, they, would, they would be so slow that they couldn't keep you going. So we need what chemists call catalysts, substances that speed up chemical reactions. And now you get the picture on the slide. Get it? Catalysts. Um, now, a biological catalyst is referred to as an enzyme. So in chemistry, they talk catalysts, and catalysts can be all sorts of things. They can be metals, they can be uh, other stuff. But in biology, when we talk catalysts, we only talk about organic catalysts, things made of carbon, right? And those organic catalysts are referred to as enzymes. And these are proteins that serve as catalysts. They speed up reactions in a living system. 
Now, enzymes are incredibly important. Uh, they're a much bigger part of my uh, upper level classes, my biomed class, my AP class, because enzymes are the key to understanding so many ideas in complex biology. But for us, we're just going to take a really simple approach, and we're going to get the basics on what an enzyme is. Um, and so, basically, an enzyme helps a reaction take place. And to do that, when you have any kind of reaction, your reactants have to actually collide with each other. So you got, you know, this one reactant, we'll call it reactant one, and you got this other reactant, we'll call it reactant two, and these two things actually have to smack into each other, right, kaboom, right, in order to get a reaction. Sometimes this is harder to get to happen than other times, and so what you can do is you can have an enzyme. And an enzyme will help that take place. It will physically help to bring the reactants together. And what that does, so this is a huge point right here, is an enzyme lowers the activation energy of a reaction. So notice this picture up here. Here's an energy diagram again, like we saw earlier. The blue line, right, is without an enzyme. And you can see that this hill is pretty big, right, that you have to climb. The red line is the reaction with an enzyme. And so you'll notice that that is a much smaller hill to climb. Look at how much smaller my red bar is here versus my blue bar. So we lower this hill, and it makes it easier for the reaction to take place. The analogy I always give is, is if I'm at the park with my kids and they're trying to drag a wagon up a hill. I don't know why they would do that, but they're trying to drag a wagon up a hill. If I'm an enzyme, I don't help them pull the wagon. I come back with a bulldozer and I make the hill smaller so it's easier for them to get over the hill. That's what an enzyme does. And it does this, like I said a minute ago, in a really physical way. An enzyme has a binding location called an active site. And the active site basically grabs your two reactants and helps bring them together so that they will actually collide. So a lot of times, too, I think of an enzyme like a matchmaker, right? If you're that person who's always looking out for your, for your best friend and trying to find a, a cute dude for her to go to the movies with, and, and, and you find this cute guy and you find your best friend, you bring them together, right? Uh, you don't just suggest they go to the movies. You actually pick them both up and, and you all go to the movies together. So you physically bring them together. You're enzyming, right? You're making it more likely that those two people are going to collide with each other um, and come together. Now, a human example, going back to something we mentioned on the first day of these chemistry notes, and that is that uh, we need to get carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out of your bloodstream, but those are gases, and, and they don't dissolve well in the bloodstream. So when your cells create carbon dioxide as a waste, and we have to get that carbon dioxide to your lungs, we got to transfer that CO2 from the tissue, like you see here, into your bloodstream. Now, what we do then is we don't just throw the carbon dioxide in. What we do is we combine carbon dioxide and water to form a soluble compound called carbonic acid, H2CO3. Now, carbonic acid is really soluble in blood. It, it likes to dissolve in the bloodstream. So it travels in the bloodstream. When you get to your lungs, we reverse that reaction, boop, go back the other way, and the carbon dioxide can be released as a gas and exhaled out of your body. Okay, so that's a reaction that has to take place. But again, if we waited for that reaction to take place naturally, it would be way too slow, and you would essentially asphyxiate, right? The carbon dioxide would not get out of your body fast enough, and it would kill you. Luckily, you've got an enzyme, right? So instead of allowing that carbon dioxide to build up inside of you, 
you have an enzyme in your blood called carbonic anhydrase. I know that's a mouthful. Carbonic anhydrase. But carbonic anhydrase makes that reaction on the last time, or on the last slide, go 10 million times faster than the reaction would go on its own. So I uh, put these little pictures here. This is like taking a rowboat and turning it into a crazy fast speedboat. All right, we take this reaction that's really slow, and carbonic anhydrase can make it really, really fast. Now, while we're on this slide, just a, a note. Enzyme names almost always end in ASE. So if you see any kind of chemical, and it's something, something ACE, that's a good indication that you are talking about an enzyme, like we see here, carbonic anhydrase. All right, so I know that's a lot. Again, think about questions you might have. We'll kind of recap this stuff in class, and then we'll move forward and learn these principles better by doing a few different uh, labs. Thanks for listening.